From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Kamala Harris and Donald Trump get set for their first debate and maybe their only debate of the 2024 campaign as the polling in the presidential race tightens into what looks like a dead heat. Welcome. I'm Kyle Peterson with The Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnist Bill McGurn and editorial board member Mane Ukwe Barua. The stage is set at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia in the pivotal swing state of Pennsylvania for a 90-minute televised clash tonight, the first time that Donald Trump and Kamala Harris have ever met face-to-face. Uh, the hosts will be ABC's David Muir and Lindsey Davis. No audience, no props, but each of the candidates will get a pen and paper provided two minutes for rebuttals, and they're not allowed to ask each other any questions. Vice President Harris seems to be holding her cards close to her chest, but Donald Trump predictably was doing phone interviews this morning with NBC. Here's part of what he said about Kamala Harris, his opponent. Quote, you don't know what to expect. She's changed all of her policies over the years. However, he said that it makes it much easier. She's no longer believable, unquote. So, Bill, as we go into this first debate, what do you expect? What does each side do you think need to do to make a real advance and get this race out of what it looks to be a polling stalemate? Well, two different things to do. Donald Trump has already defined himself. So he doesn't need to do that. He gives hour-long press interviews and Q&As and so forth. So he's all defined, but he has to define Kamala Harris. And because the press won't ask questions, his job is that much tougher. It won't demand follow-ups. Kamala Harris, it seems to me, has to hold her own, not give any of the word salads that she's done in so many interviews before, not make any gaffes. I think that's really all she has to do is not make any gaffes and sound reasonable and not allow herself to be flustered by Donald Trump. So everyone knows what the challenges are going into a debate. But once the clocks are ticking, you don't know what people do under fire. Manet, what's your take? I guess my thought is similar to my view of the campaign overall, which is that there are still many voters in the middle who are not thrilled with this binary choice that they're going to be presented with. They have concerns that Kamala Harris is farther to the left, more progressive than they probably think the country needs to go. Those previous answers from the 2020 campaign about about Medicare for all and so forth. And then on the other side, there are probably many of those voters who think, oh, Donald Trump, are we really going to do this again as a country for the next four years? And I expect he's probably going to get a question about how he would govern. This is a notable truth social tweet from this weekend on Saturday, just a few days ago, talking again about his claims that the 2020 election was stolen. He says that it was a disgrace to our nation Therefore, the 2024 election where voters have just started being cast will be under the closest professional scrutiny. And when I win, those people that cheated will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, which will include long term prison sentences. And so, Manet, my thought is what he needs to do is control his frustration, his anger. He did a pretty good job of that, I think, through most of the first debate. But there were still times when it came out and he got ranty again about the 2020 election. Election. And I don't think that promising to lock more people up when he gets into office and take revenge on his loss there is going to move any swing voters to his side. Yeah, I think, believe it or not, Trump has slowly but surely been creeping his way toward a little bit more discipline over time. I think that truth social still is where he's at his worst. Often, I think when he's just sitting by himself, he'll pull out his phone and let loose on whatever his frustration of the day happens to be. And that's where you see him sometimes veer back into election denial conspiracism or threatening to prosecute his political enemies. But in front of the cameras at his rallies and also in his debate with Joe Biden, he's been a little bit more restrained in this election cycle than he was in 2016 or 2020. And certainly his advisors are going to be trying to coach him as much as is possible into leaning in that side. So I think that it's possible that 
Kamala Harris or the moderators will say something that will trigger him and he'll have an episode where he looks uh, really, really undisciplined and makes some of the swing voters worry. But it is possible and probably his intention to try to present a slightly more moderate face. And then in terms of his approach to defining Kamala Harris, as Bill rightly said he needs to do, I think that he's focused a lot over the first part of the campaign on trying to define her character, saying that she's phony, questioning her racial authenticity, questioning her uh, credibility personally or and also her intelligence. And that didn't really seem to work as much as he hoped. I think that he was hoping that he'd be able to characterize her in the same way that he did Hillary Clinton in 2016 and make her unlikable in voters' eyes. But what's really more important for him to do is characterize her on policy terms to point out some of the radical positions that she's taken in 2019 when she was running for president in particular. And if he can do that consistently, show people that she would be a dangerous choice uh, for president on policy grounds, I think it's much more likely that he'll be able to break through. So hopefully he can show discipline in both of those two ways if he wants to actually uh, change the conversation for voters who are going to be paying attention in the debate. Bill, you touched on this a minute ago, but your column in the journal this week is under the headline, Press Failure Inflates the Debate. And give us a sense of what your argument there is. Well, debates are always important. As we saw, the debate in July killed Joe Biden's chances for re-election. But they're usually not dispositive. Many candidates have not done well in the first debates. And my former boss, George Bush, didn't do well in his debate as president running for a second term. Neither did Reagan, neither did Obama, and it didn't cost him the election. But the stakes are much higher because we still don't know from Harris, from her own words and listening to her own explanation, what she stands for, what she really stands for, and why she said to have repudiated all her earlier earlier positions. So the American public, I think the um, New York Times had a poll where a large percentage view her as left of center. And ironically, they view Trump as uh, center. So it's not fooling everyone. But because the press hasn't asked routine questions and let them get away with these flimsy answers, I mean, Tom Cotton puts Jonathan Carr when he said Kamala Harris has said she no longer believes in some of these things he was bringing up. And he said, no, she hasn't said it. Her surrogates may have said it on Friday night, but we haven't heard from her. So she's been able to avoid. She's had no press conference since she was nominated. And people say it has to end, that sooner or later she has to get out there and behave like a normal candidate. I'm not sure she will. I think this might be her best strategy to try to get through with as few events where she might have to answer a hard question as possible. Hang tight. We'll be right back in a moment. Welcome back. On the point about debates and whether they make a difference in campaigns, you often hear skeptics say that they're quickly forgotten. On the other hand, as Bill lays out, the Trump-Biden debate clearly is what ended President Biden's 2024 campaign. And if this is the only opportunity that voters are going to get before November to see Kamala Harris for 90 minutes in an unscripted format, I do wonder whether tonight could be another exception. And I'll point to an NPR PBS Marist poll out this morning. It says 70 percent of Americans will watch all or most of the presidential debate between Harris and Trump. An additional 23 percent say they won't watch, but will closely follow the news. I'm a little skeptical of that number. 70 percent of Americans watching a debate would be an extraordinary figure. But this, I think, is more interesting. 30 percent of registered voters say the debate will help them a great deal or a good amount in making their selection for president. And just as a reminder, that Biden-Trump debate was watched by about 51 million viewers in June, which is a pretty good chunk of the number of voters that end up turning out in a presidential election. Manet, to the argument that Bill is making about Kamala Harris's strategy of avoiding these kinds of press interviews, do you think that is potentially a mistake? Stake because the fact that she has only done one real sit down, a two on one with her sidekick, Tim Walls, with CNN, it puts a lot of pressure on her tonight. And if she were 
without doing these kinds of interviews all the time, maybe voters would be more inclined to write off a flub or a mistake or an answer tonight that they didn't like so much. Well, I think as a matter of pure strategy, you have to say it isn't a mistake, that it makes sense from the Harris campaign's perspective. And the reason for that is because they know their candidate better than the public does, better than the press does. And if she is terrified of the prospect of sitting down with interviewers and taking tough questions, that's probably for a reason. And we have seen years of Kamala Harris sitting down in interviews, giving absolutely atrocious answers that showed how unprepared she was on a lot of tough policy questions, how easily she gets confused or gives false or embarrassing answers to things. And they really believe that because she received the nomination so late in the game that it is possible to run this strategy of protecting her from scrutiny. And so I think that if she does make a huge mistake in her debate against Trump, then you can retroactively say maybe it would have been better to get her in front of the cameras more, get her a little bit more practice, have more sound bites out there so that whatever she does to muck it up in the debate doesn't stand out quite as much. But I think that there's a reason why they are protecting her, and it's because she remains so terrified of scrutiny. And so I think that a lot of people watching will be trying to see if she's able to turn in a competent performance that does change the perception of her as someone who is so weak in front of scrutiny. And in fairness, if you look back to the vice presidential debate against Mike Pence in 2020, she was able to hold her own there. I don't think you could say it was a particularly impressive performance, but she didn't do anything to implode or really embarrass herself. So that's probably the bar that she wants to hit, avoiding doing anything that's going to be really damaging. But I think that it makes sense that they're going to continue after the debate to probably limit her exposure as much as they possibly can, because they know that that's the biggest liability that they face between now and the November elections. One rule that's also worth mentioning since it will shape this television event is the mute button. And recall that the first debate between President Trump and Joe Biden in 2020 was an interruptathon just full of crosstalk. And so the agreement between the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign this year for the first debate was that when it's not a candidate's turn to speak, that microphone will be muted. And And then after Biden dropped out of the race, the Harris campaign wanted to renegotiate that. Here's a story in Politico. It says Kamala Harris had planned to object, fact check and directly question Donald Trump while he was speaking during their debate next week. But now with the rules just finalized to mute the candidates when their opponent speaks, campaign officials said Harris advisors are scrambling to rewrite their playbook. And Bill, I find it hard to hold the attempt to renegotiate these rules again. Kamala Harris because it was an agreement between the Trump campaign and the Biden campaign, and there is no longer a Biden campaign. And also, Donald Trump wanted to renegotiate some rules and add some extra debates and so forth. So these things are always up for negotiation between the campaigns. But I tend to think that the mute button, although Trump maybe chafed against it in his debate with Joe Biden a little bit, I tend to think it helped him by helping to keep him within the guardrails and avoid his worst instinct. Yeah, I agree absolutely with you. The mute button was his best friend. It let the focus be on Joe Biden, especially if you compare it with his earlier debate in 2020 with Joe Biden, which I think was a disaster for Trump because he interrupted so much. This helped him. It shows when he shows some discipline and he occasionally does, he can achieve his desired effect. So I think the mute button helps Trump. And it also helps him in this case, because I think Kamala Harris is looking for a moment where she can say, I'm speaking, Mr. Trump. Mute button means that's not likely to happen, to put him down for interrupting her and look strong. So as far as the rules of the road, I think that it's good for Trump. And I'd go even further. I'd say it doesn't really matter which set of rules you choose. Candidates have to adhere and adapt. And part of voting for a president is knowing what they can do. And you don't always have perfect circumstances. So the rules were not friendly for Trump. If they didn't have the mute button, he would have to show more discipline himself. I don't think it matters which set of rules you choose. You have to operate within the rules. Both candidates have to follow them and see who does better.